okay, now I'm wired up. Uh, so I want to, first, before starting, I, I want to thank both Gustavos and Ines for uh, inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to meet people, to see this really wonderful country and wonderful city. So this has been a real gift, and uh, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, today, I'm going to, I have a, a variety of goals in, in this talk. We'll see how far I get in those. But as you can see, it's going to be about this funny protein that I have been involved in for many years called the green fluorescent protein, or GFP. And I want to talk a little bit about how science is done. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our misconceptions of science. But let me give you an idea about a, a basic problem. If we look at, as in this slide, if we look at a cell, uh, this is an early embryo of this tiny worm we work at, if we look at that first fertilized egg, and it goes through a single division to produce the first two cell embryo, and we look down the microscope, and we basically can't see anything. We see those circles within the last picture there, letter D, those are the nucleus, but other than that, everything looks the same. We really can't see anything. And yet we know from electron micrographs that there's lots of junk in there. There's lots of different things, and we really would be, really like to be able to see these things, especially to just present a problem of those two cells in panel D, because one of the cells, the one on the left, gives, divides many times and gives rise to cells that will make up the body of the animal. The cell on the right does the same thing, but only that cell gives rise to the cells that will become the sperm and egg that will give rise to the next generation. And so one of the most immediate questions one would have is how can that difference come apart? How do you divide a cell such that one part does one thing and the other cell does something else? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how that's been done and how this protein GFP has really helped us to do a variety of things not only discover new biology, but to gain insights into human disease and human health. It's been used to detect landmines, or at least try to do that. It's changed industry. There's been a lot of strange consequences of this, and I want to talk a little bit about that, that strangeness, that one never knows what's going to happen when you start and develop something, and there's sometimes very unusual consequences. But before I do that, I also want to talk about the idea of who scientists are and how we do science. Because I realized a couple of years ago, I was asked to talk to some high school teachers, and I realized that all the things I learned in elementary school and in high school were not maybe correct about scientists. And I learned these things not because there was a class, but because I would read the stories about the great scientists of the past. Newton and Galileo and Einstein and Darwin, all these incredible and towering figures. Reading about them or hearing about them gave me an idea about science. And so what are the ideas about science? Well, first, uh, scientists are geniuses, right? And if you're not a genius, you may as well quit right now. Don't even start. Do something else. And you don't actually know if you're a genius, but somehow these people do. Unfortunately, undergraduates usually look at their grades to see if they're geniuses. That is a big mistake. Um, but anyway, that's how we feel about it. These people must be, you know, just so different from everybody else. Um, I want to say a little bit more about that. I mean, there's this feeling that they have this ability, and probably no one else in the world would ever have that ability. Um, that's a little bit like saying that athletes are just naturally gifted. Athletes work like hell to get 
where they are, as do musicians and any artist and so on. It's not it just comes to you. It, you have to work at it. So this idea that it's innate, don't worry about it, it'll just come or not. And if it doesn't, quit. That's all right. The second thing is that experiments that scientists do, the great scientists, not the rest of us, but the great scientists, those experiments always work the first time. Because we don't have time to tell the story of how they failed. And so we never hear that part of the story. We just hear that they're perfect. And their experiments work the first time. So if your experiments don't, that's pretty good proof that you're not a genius and that's the problem. <laughs> Now the third thing I learned about these great scientists is that they thought differently from everybody else I ever knew. They had this peculiar way of thinking called the scientific method. And in the scientific method, they think of a problem that no one in the history of the world has ever thought of. But not only do they think of a problem, they think of a solution. They come up with a hypothesis. And once they have the hypothesis, they design the perfect experiment. The perfect experiment works the first time. Their hypothesis is proved. They get a lot of prizes and money, and everything's wonderful. <laughs> the fourth thing about all these peculiar people that I learned about, and I think we still have these attitudes toward these people, is that for some reason, they always were loners. They always worked alone. Now, they could have an assistant. <laughs> For some reason, the assistant's name always seems to be Igor. But other <laughs> than that, that's who they are. And they work alone. Now, I went to high school. I went to, had high school biology in 1962. That was the year that Watson and Crick won the Nobel Prize, or shared the Nobel Prize with Morris Wilkins for elucidating the structure of DNA. But that hadn't made it into our textbooks yet, so that was, we, we hadn't learned about that. So we never heard that two people could work together. Everyone works alone. And the final thing is that all these great scientists of the past, except for exceptionally rare uh, instances, were always, the rare instances were Marie Curie, George Washington Carver, every single one of these people was a white man. Someone that was European or of European descent. And if you go on to Google today and look for images of great scientists, this is the picture you still get. And in this picture of the great scientists, only It'll come up, I hope, soon. There we go. Marie Curie and Rosalind Franklin are the only women on this slide. George Washington Carver, way the hell away on another slide. Not considered important. And you look at some of these people on this slide, and I'm not convinced that they're like, would be in my top 50 list of the great scientists, but it's, this is what people search for. So we're still confronted with this problem. Let me get, at least get rid of this problem right now because I want to show you a picture of the people that have gone through my laboratory in the last five, six years or so. Uh, one day I just decided to make this slide. So we have people from Chile, Peru, Colombia, China, Ch uh, Iceland, the Gambia in Africa, Greece, Israel, as well as the United States. That's what a modern lab looks like. It's really an effort by everybody, not an effort by a small group uh, of, of people. Um, let me go on to actually give the real talk. But what I want you to keep in mind is that all of those ideas, yes, sometimes geniuses happen to do science. That's good. Sometimes people work alone. Sometimes all of these things happen. But the GFP story is going to give you examples of where this is complete nonsense all the way through. And that's one of the reasons I bring this up. So I have to tell you my mindset at what I consider the beginning of the story. And that is that I was working on the nervous system of this worm, Centerebditis elegans. Now, 
we were, I was mainly interested in mutants that made the animal insensitive to touch, collected lots of these mutant animals. The mutants were defective in many genes and they affected two aspects of the cell because you could make an animal insensitive to touch by not being able to make the sensing cell. The cell's not made, you can't sense anything, but those genes were gonna help us study the process of development. How, do, how does an organism make a particular type, in this case, of, of a nerve cell? And the other set of mutants were such that you got rid of the, the gene, the cells were beautiful. They just didn't work. And we really wanted to understand the molecular basis of the sense of touch, which is what these cells responded to. And at the time, well, let me put it a slightly different way. Biologists have known for the last 130 or so years that the molecule that allows us to see is rhodopsin. They were able to isolate this from cow eyes, cow retina, because it's just the most abundant protein there. And so it's easy to find the molecule that allowed us to see. Over the last 40 or so years, people have done a lot of experiments identifying the receptors that allow us to respond to chemicals, whether those are smells or tastes or their uh, <coughs> molecules that respond to hormones within the body or neurotransmitters. So we know how chemical signaling works. But we have a vast number of senses that work mechanically. Our sense of hearing, our sense of balance, our, the stretch of our muscles and our tendons, the detection of blood pressure within us, the sense of touch, of which there are at least five different types of cells in our skin. All of these act because these cells are perturbed physically. And when we started this work, no one had a clue as to how this worked. In fact, we still don't know what the molecule is that allows us to hear. But we wanted to use this animal to identify the molecules that allowed it to sense touch. And I won't go into that, but I'll say that we actually did do that a couple of years ago. We were able to show that we had the right molecule. In any case, as we did all these mutagenesis and got all these mutants, we started cloning the genes. And so it was about 1988, 89, we started cloning genes. And once you cloned a gene that was defective in a mutant, one of the very first questions you want to know is what cells turn on that gene? All cells have all the genes, but only some cells will turn, a particular gene will be turned on only in some cells. So our question was, is this gene that we've now found, is it expressed in the touch sensing cells or in some other cell? And knowing where this gene is turned on is important. So that was the problem. Now, if this was the classical science talk, that would be a problem no one had ever thought of. But that's complete nonsense because people had lots of ways of answering that question. And we used many of those. So you know DNA encodes RNA, and the RNA is the instructions for the making of protein. So you could look for it in a number of ways. You could use an antibody to, to the protein that was made, and only the cells that turned on the gene would make that protein. And you could see it using an antibody. Or as in the bottom panel there, you could use a probe that would hybridize to the RNA and show you that the RNA had been made. So that was called in C2 hybridization. Or you could basically have the gene not make what it usually does, but make something that you could see. So this is the idea of using a reporter. And in 1962, Malcolm Casataban had said, you know what would be a wonderful tool for this? to look at genes being turned on, it would be the E. coli LACZ product, the enzyme beta-galactosidase. And so you have beta-galactosidase turned on by the gene, and then you have a K 
chemical reaction that allows you to see where it's been turned on, where the enzyme is. Uh, it's called the substrate is called X-scale, and you get this be this beautiful set of blue dots. Now, all of these, uh, for those of you that don't, uh, it may be important. Beta galactosides can be used in, in actually two ways. Genes have two parts to them. One part of the gene is what should be made. So that's the RNA that's going to be made and ultimately the protein, the product. But there's another part to the gene. That's the regulatory part, the controlling part that says where, when, and how much. So you can do two things. You can have just that controlling part make the enzyme. And so whatever the gene was turned on, the enzyme would be turned on, you'd see that. Or you could try to do something a little trickier. You could take the controlling part, have it make the right protein, but have that, pro have that protein attached to beta-galactosidase too. So now wherever the protein went, it would bring this enzyme and you could see where that was. So these are all possible, and we did them all. But there is a problem here, and the problem is you have to really do a lot of work, and that work entails killing the sample, fixing it such that nothing moves around, permeabilizing it, poking holes in it so you can get the antibody inside, or the substrate for beta-galactosidase, or the probe for the in situ hybridization, into this dead tissue, because if not, it wasn't going to get in there, you wouldn't see anything. So there's a lot of preparation, and it wound up, because the specimen was dead, it gave you a snapshot. This is what happened at the time we killed the, the tissue. Now, that gave us the answer, but we would then have to do it all over again. So the two problems are repeating everything over and over and over again by making, going through the whole prep, and then only getting an instant in time. And, but, but before I leave this slide, I want to mention one thing. You'll see pictures of people, and their names are going to be in different colors. Uh, the people whose names are in red are people from my lab. People whose names are in blue are collaborators. And people whose names are in black, as you'll see on the next slide, did something I'm very envious of. <laughs> so when, uh, so uh, we're doing this work. We're sort of just having a good time in the lab. And one day I go to a seminar. And I'm in the seminar, and I haven't fallen asleep yet, which I usually do in seminars. And I listen to the introduction. And the introduction of the seminar talks about this man, Osama Shimomura, and his work on the jellyfish Aquaria Victoria. And I urge, strongly urge you, to go to the nobelprize.org website and read his 20, either watch his 29 minute video or read his short uh, lecture about his life and GFP and the discovery of GFP. Among other things, at the age of 16, he's told, that's it, you have to quit high school, you have to go work in a factory, no more school for you. And so he leaves school, he leaves the city he's in, he goes over the mountains to the adjacent valley, and he works in a paint factory. That turns out actually not to be so bad for him, because the year was 1945, and the city was Nagasaki, Japan, and he was protected from the city being destroyed by the atomic bomb because he was on the other side of the mountains. He went in and helped people, uh, but there was, uh, after World War II, there was no school to go to until they finally started to rebuild. And then when they finally rebuilt, he went to the pharmacy school because it was the only college he could go to that was near his home, graduates, likes biochemistry, and gets a job as a technician. He also happens to be in this job as a technician. He's given a really, it's, a, it's 
it's a nasty thing, but people that are the heads of labs do this all the time, I have to admit. They gave them a project that several other people had tried and failed at, but they didn't tell him that they failed at it, <laughs> hoping that he would be the one to figure it out, and he did. And the project was to identify the protein that was needed, the enzyme, that was needed for a small crustacean called cypridina to generate light. And that became sort of his focus of all his research and his continued interest. How do different organisms produce light? Fascinating question. Has nothing to do with human health. It's just a terrific biological question because although there's lots of organisms that can generate light, fireflies, glowworms, bacteria, fungi, fish, all sorts of organisms, they all do it differently. And so there's a lot of work <laughs> left for people to do. And so he was interested in that. He had done that. The fact that he had succeeded in figuring out how cypridina generated light uh, had two important consequences. The first consequence was that he was invited to come to the United States to continue work on bioluminescent organisms, and he had accepted that. And the second consequence was that his boss, the person who had hired him as a technician at Nagoya University, arranged to give him a rather unusual going away present, his PhD. <laughs> Not a bad present to get. So he comes to the United States, and goes to uh, Friday Harbor Lab in Washington State and starts working on this jellyfish because he wants to know how this jellyfish, Aquaria Victoria, generates light. Because the jellyfish produces a wonderful green light. So he starts working. This involves grinding up tens and then hundreds and then thousands of jellyfish, basically because the experiments never work. He goes through the whole summer, he keeps grinding up jellyfish, trying to do different ways of isolating whatever this protein he hopes will generate light. He bribes his kids to find him more jellyfish. <laughs> and he eventually, uh, he's doing the experiments, they're failing every single time. One night, he's worked well into the night, it's dark outside, He's hungry, he wants to go home for dinner, he's frustrated that everything hasn't worked, but he's a very orderly person and he cleans up. And he takes all of his samples and he throws them in the sink. Now, the sink also happened to have the overflow of some tanks they had in the uh, laboratory that had some seawater in them and probably some other junk bits of jellyfish or who knows what. And he, but he throws it away turns off the light, he's about to leave when he happens to look back at the sink. And when he looks back at the sink, he sees that it's glowing. <laughs> sort of a surprise. And as he looks at that, he, he wonders, why is it glowing? Is there something in the sink that I have never used in my experiment? And he thought about the seawater and said, well, you know, seawater has calcium in it. Maybe if I add calcium, I will be able to get light. And so, after a day or so, he does the prep again. And now, every time he squirts in a solution of calcium ions, he gets a flash of light. So he's figured out how to purify it. He uses that as an assay, purifies the protein, and names the protein after the jellyfish. He calls it a corn. So a corn plus calcium produces light. So I just want to go back over what I just said. That's a real use of the scientific method. You know, throw it in the sink. I have known of people that have gotten very good results by throwing their preps on the lab bench and then bringing, putting them back together and seeing what happens sometimes on the floor. So it's a tried and true scientific uh, procedure. In any case, so that was the first of what I call the two accidents. But they, then the second thing comes up. He's answered his question. That is, what's the molecule that generates light? 
Unfortunately, he looks at the light and realizes it's the wrong color. It's not the green of the jellyfish, it's blue light. And he samples, he puts calcium in all the other samples, nothing. Doesn't work. But then thinks, wait a minute, maybe it's not generating light. Maybe it's converting light. This molecule will make the blue light, but maybe there's another molecule that converts the blue light to green. And so he takes a handheld UV lamp and he sort of looks at every one of his samples and sure enough, a corn's down here at another place, that's where a protein is that when he shines blue or ultraviolet light on it, he gets this brilliant green color, the green color of the jellyfish back. So he's found it. He was never going after a protein that was fluorescent, because that's what fluorescence is, the absorption of light of one color and giving off light of a different color, a lower energy color. But he realizes, this is great, I have this other protein. So in 1962, he writes a paper up about purifying a corn, and in the paper there's footnote number three that says, by the way, there is this other protein that if you shine blue light on it, you get green. I'm going to call it the green protein. Well, we, of course, call it GFP or the green fluorescent protein. And uh, that's all he says about it. But with GFP, now you get this whole reaction producing green light. I, want to point, I point out the footnote to say you really don't have to write a lot to get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> but as far as I know, this is the only footnote that is won. So, you know, it doesn't have to be extensive volumes here. So I'm listening to a seminar, and you have to remember, I only have a few thoughts in my head. One thought is the same thing I had said to people for 12 years before that about C. elegans. I work on a transparent animal. Nobody else in the room was working on a transparent animal. And then, the other thing is, I want to look at where genes are active. And someone has just told me there's a protein that if it's produced, I will be able to see it only by shining blue light onto the molecule. I'll be able to see it green, and in my transparent animal, I'll be able to see it. And I realize I'll be able to see this in a living animal. I'll be able to mark these cells. I'll be able to... And I started fantasizing about all the things that I would do. Now, the introduction of stuff about uh, uh, Shimomura was at the beginning of the talk. I have no idea what the guy talked about for the whole seminar. I just fantasized about my experiments and what I wanted to do, because I realized that what this was was going to provide a lantern. Actually, if you look at that molecule, it looks like a lantern. And about four days ago, I got out of the blue, I got an email from a graphic designer. And the guy said, I've just made this design. I wondered if you're interested in it. And I'd look at it, and the, my immediate email was, can I use it in my seminar? Because what he's done is he's taken the molecule of GFP and made it a filament in a light bulb, <laughs> which it really is. So it's, quite, it's, it's a very wonderful picture. I'm very happy he gave it to me. In any case, I've heard about this, this wonderful molecule. I immediately tried to find out who was studying it, and I learned that this man, Douglas Prasher, was in the process of isolating the DNA encoding uh, GFP. And we had a wonderful conversation, and we talked about how we could collaborate, and I would put this in bacteria and worms, and it would be wonderful, and we'd be able to see it, and it would be a great marker. And then we lost track of each other for three years. And at the end of the three years, uh, a new graduate student, Gia Skirkin, came into the lab. She had already been at Columbia for a while in our engineering department, chemical engineering, and she knew about fluorescence. She had studied fluorescence as a master's student, and so she seemed the perfect person to work on this. But I told her, I said, you know, I was going to collaborate with this guy, Douglas Prasher, but he hasn't gotten back in touch with me. I think he didn't succeed in his experiment. And then we happened to look online. The university had just put uh, databases online for us, and there was his paper. He had indeed cloned the cDNA for it, 
And it was very exciting, but he thought I had dropped out of science. And so he didn't get in touch with me. Or he tried at one point, and I was on sabbatical, and I think someone in the lab said, oh, Marty, he's not here anymore. That was, <laughs> that was sort of the end of that. Anyway, we got back together, we clarified our <laughs> what really happened, and he sent us the clone for the, this, and Gia, at the very first month of being in graduate school, put it into E. coli, and that's what circled in red there from her page from her lab notebook, and it says fluorescing E. coli, and then parentheses strongly. So he, she had put the gene into E. coli, they had made the protein, they became fluorescence, and she took that picture on that first night uh, when she did the experiment. But one thing that's not in this, so this actually is an experiment that did work the first time. Okay? That turned out to be exceptionally important, as I'll explain in a moment. But there's another thing on this slide I always like to point out, is that Gia actually used the microscope in her old lab in the engineering school. Why did she do that? Well, my fluorescence microscope was a piece of junk. It was absolutely no good. She tried to use it. It just didn't give a good image, and, but she knew where a good microscope was. She went, and there was a lot of jumping around in the lab. This was, we were all very happy, but we had a problem, and the problem was we didn't have a microscope, which we really needed. And so, and we, we sort of got kicked off the engineering microscope, and then there was a departmental microscope. We got kicked off of that. And so I solved this problem by writing to the, uh, or calling up the various representatives for the microscope companies in New York City, and I said, we've just developed a new method to look at gene expression. Very excited about this. It uses a fluorescent microscope, and ours is no good. We need to buy a new one. I just don't know which microscope I should buy. So if you could bring yours by and loan it to us, maybe for a month or two, that would be really good, and we could give it a good test. So everything in the paper was done on borrowed microscopes. <laughs> but it worked, and it was quite nice. Now, I mentioned that Gia's experiment did not, it was an experiment that worked the first time. No one that knew anything about GFP thought it would work. This was an incredibly stupid experiment that anyone in their right mind would not have wasted a moment dealing with. And the reason was this. We often think of proteins, or we know that proteins are made as long chains of amino acids. So the different characteristic parts of the amino acid are linked together with, by a chain of atoms, a linear chain of atoms, called the peptide backbone. And so part of that backbone is here, is all the peptide backbone, a linear array of atoms. But GFP does something so completely bizarre and different from other molecules that everyone said, it can't do this on its own. It needs help. There must be converting enzymes like that, MAD. And that's because these five atoms right here can, there's condensation so that you wind up with another five-membered ring. And in fact, this is absolutely needed for the fluorescence this conjugation. So as a result, um, everyone knew there had to be one, two, five, ten, who knew how many converting enzymes that would make this circle. So we shouldn't have done the experiment, but we're sort of stubborn people and we did it anyway and it worked. And that said, there are no converting enzymes. Actually, there's one converting enzyme. The molecule itself does the conversion. So it can work on its own, which made it very useful, because if it needed a bunch of other things to become fluorescent, it wouldn't be a very useful molecule. Anyway, her experiment worked. I know of three other groups that were trying to do the same experiment at the same time. When they did the experiment, it did not work, ever. 
So what was the difference between my group and what Gia did and these other people and what they did? The real answer to that is those other people were careful and we were sloppy. <laughs> or maybe careful in a different way. And let me explain that. This is a diagram of the piece of DNA that people got from Douglas Prasher. Everyone got it from Douglas. And this has, the green part here is the coding sequence for GFP. The red parts are extra bits of jellyfish DNA. If at the time, 1992, you were careful and you wanted to get lots of copies of DNA so you could clone it into things or do other experiments, what you did is you let an expert make the DNA. And the expert was E. coli. They'd been doing this for millions and millions of years. They knew how to make DNA accurately, so you put it into the bacterium, you let that grow, the bacteria grow, and then get the DNA out, and then use that DNA for your experiments. And the way you use the DNA is you cut out exactly what you wanted, and then use that. Well, the cutting was done with an enzyme called EcoR1, and as you can see, cutting this out gives you the red and the green bits together. I didn't know what the red bits are, I was just sort of nervous about having anything I didn't need in the experiment. And so I suggested to Gia that she not do this, but rather use polymerase chain reaction to amplify things. So that you use a primer, this little green arrow here and that little green arrow there, copy the DNA, and then use that. Even though it was known that a lot of the times when you copy DNA, it's bad. Errors are put in, it's just bad stuff. But I have to remind you, we were gonna put this into millions upon millions of bacteria. So frankly, I didn't care if 99.99% .99 was bad, because some of it was gonna be good, and we would put that in the bacteria too, and so I didn't want, I, that every bacterium was green, I just wanted one to be green. And so, as I say, we were sloppy in the use of PCR, but we were careful in the sense of taking exactly what we need. People have never gone back to really study this, but there's something in the red bits that just makes the experiment not work. I don't know what they are. As I say, no one has studied that, but we were very fortunate we did the experiment in one way and not the other. So it worked, we were happy about it, we put it in worms, we were happy about that, it worked beautifully in worms, and then we decided to publish the paper. I wanna talk a little bit about problems of scientific publication, in case any of you have encountered some of these. And the first one I wanna mention is that we decided we were gonna send this paper to the journal Science. Not be, there was no impact factors at that time. And no one knew about that stuff. But science was a journal that was read by all biologists, as all scientists. And as a result, I didn't want this to go to a, 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 a biology journal in a specific field. I wanted everybody to, to be able to use this. So we sent it to science. And I have to tell you that the editors of science think exceptionally highly of their journal and themselves. <laughs> and they don't just send your paper out for review, they think about your paper for a couple of weeks. And then they decide whether your paper is worthy to be reviewed before they reject it, or whatever. And so we sent the paper out, two weeks later or so, I hear from the editor, and she says, you know, we really, was, your paper was sort of interesting, but I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to tell you, we're not sending it out to the reviewers. And I said, why not? But is, is there something particularly wrong? She said, yes, there is. We don't like your title. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, that's a nice title, Green Fluorescent Protein, a new marker for gene expression. Short, 
concise, says what I wanted to say. And I was informed that every article in the journal Science was new and novel, so therefore you could not use those words in the title. I asked if I could change the title. And would it be sent out for review? And I think she actually said maybe. But anyway, I changed the title. And I think you can detect a little annoyance in because of, well, this is the title. The Aquarian Quifactoria green fluorescent protein needs no exogenously added component to produce a fluorescent product in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. This is the entire paper. I could have just appended the pictures and that would be it, but there was actually a little bit of text as well. And this got sent to the reviewers and they accepted it. Although one reviewer did say, well, he actually didn't learn any new biology, but fortunately it went through. And the copy editor calls me up, <coughs> me. and she says, we're glad your paper is accepted, but do you know that your title is rather long? <laughs> Could you shorten it? And I said, I don't know. Um, let me think. Hey, well, how about this? Green fluorescent protein as a marker for gene expression. And I, I got this profuse thank you. <laughs> oh, that's much better, yes. So that was the first problem with publishing things, the title. The second problem was this picture that was used on the cover. And the reason I wanted this picture to be used is that it's showing a living, it was a picture taken of a living C. elegans, newly hatched larva. And in particular, it was showing that this nerve cell with its cell body here was growing out, and this is the growth cone of the neuron. And I wanted it to be sort of a, a, a signal to people that they could actually watch biology as it was occurring. You didn't have to take these various snapshots in time. That we'd be able finally to have a dynamic view of what was going on. So I was very excited that this was going to be it. I submitted it to be on the cover. The Cover editor calls me up and says, I get a lot of phone calls from these people. Uh, the cover editor calls me up and she says, oh, we really like your picture and we want to use it on the cover. Unfortunately, there's one color that we never like to use on the cover and that's green. Can we change the color? <laughs> and I said, absolutely not. And this is an enhanced picture. If you still have a library here, I think Columbia's library is gone. Uh, and you actually can get your hands on uh, seeing the cover of this issue. It's pretty washed out, but I just couldn't have them change the cover. Color. Now, the third problem with publishing is that we had already been giving away samples to people for their use. I've been talking to people about it, getting excited about it. And we gave these away, and people were starting to write me and say, you know, it works in our system, too. And so that was exciting news to have, and I wanted to include that in a footnote for the paper. That is, GFP doesn't just work in E. coli and obviously the jellyfish and C. elegans, it works in a whole bunch of other things, dictyostelium, yeast, drosophila, uh, human nerve cells in culture, uh, other cell lines and things. So there was a lot that people had found in a very short time and I wanted to cite their work. So I wrote them, I said, do I have your permission to cite your unpublished work? And virtually everyone immediately wrote me back and said, well, you gave us the stuff before you published it. Of course you can cite us for having uh, used this and having it work. Except for one person who gave me a hard time. This person, who you can't read the letter. This is, this is the main point. In order for me to be able to cite her work, I had to make coffee every Saturday for two months. I had to prepare a French dinner, and I had to take out the garbage nightly for a month. This is my wife. Um, <laughs> but what Tula did was unbelievably important. Remember I said about the two parts of the gene? Well, what we had done is we had taken the controlling part and had it turn on the production of GFP. What she did working in fruit flies uh, was to take both parts of the gene and then have GFP. So 
GFP was attached to the protein she was interested in. And this protein is actually a protein that's made in what are called the nurse cells of the fruit fly in the embryo. And this is the developing oocyte. And these proteins are made here and they are transported in and come to line along this edge and that edge in the developing oocyte. So she was watching protein being made in one cell and being transported into another. And that was really exciting. She also uh, did a terrific control because how do you know this is anywhere near the truth? Just what you see. Well, it turned out that the protein she was studying, if you got rid of the protein, the embryo never developed. However, when she put the protein attached to GFP, the animals lived and were completely normal. And that suggests that the hybrid of her protein and GFP actually was working perfectly fine and that what she was looking at was the right thing. So it was very important control, very nice idea. Uh, the only thing she made as a mistake here is that she never used the word GFP in the title or the abstract. And as a result, many people don't realize that she has the second paper on GFP. And there are some people, one person in my department, who actually thinks the wrong member of our family got the Nobel Prize. I tend often to think that might be true. In any case, GFP is useful in many different ways. First of all, it's encoded in DNA, so if you can put DNA into an organism, it will make GFP, the GFP will be fluorescent, and you can see it. And that means that the subsequent progeny will also have GFP. So you do this once, and you can follow it generation after generation after generation. Looking at it really is pretty innocuous. It doesn't really interfere to shine blue light on an organism and see green coming out of it. So it's essentially non-invasive. Third, the animal, the, the protein is actually a relatively small protein. Beta-galactosidase that had been used before, that was an obligate tetramer. And that obligate tetramer together, GFP is only a monomer. But in molecular weight, that obligate tetramer is 16 times greater in molecular weight than GFP. As a result, beta-galactosidase stays in the cell body and doesn't go anywhere else. GFP diffuses everywhere, so you can see the complete outline of cells. And as I've said many times, you can actually look at living tissue. So here is a sort of rogues gallery of organisms with GFP in them. As a nematode we work on, C. elegans, fruit flies, Alba, the GFP bunny, commissioned by, the, uh, uh, it was made by a French biotech company, commissioned by the Brazilian uh, artist who now lives in Chicago, Eduardo Koch, and he used to bring Alba, who was the family pet, to his, his art shows to get people talking about the connection between art and science. Canola plants, mice, zebrafish, and here's a bunch of cells. And look at this mouse Purkinje cell here, where GFP has not only been in the cell body, but in all of the dendrites and in the axon coming out. It's just a, a wonderful way of seeing the entire cell. Now, I've said several times about looking at things that are living. I want to give you a little bit of that experience. These films were made by Rosalind Silverman Gabrilla. I've never met her. She, uh, I, at the time, was a graduate student in Canada, but fortunately she made these movies and put them onto the website of the American Society for Cell Biology, which is how I was able to get them. And what you're going to be looking at is the early nuclear divisions in fruit flies, in Drosophila. And so what happens is that, of course, the nucleus when the cells divide, or in this case, just the nuclei divide, the nucleus breaks down, the chromosomes are attached to what's called the spindle, they're separated, and then you have two new nuclei that are formed. That's all the cell biology you need to know. On the left-hand side, 
GFP is attached to a protein that's part of the spindle. So you're going to watch four rounds, so this is quite sp sped up, we're going to, you're going to watch four rounds of cell division and watch the spindle form and not as these are nuclear division. So let me start that. There we go. There's the spindle. And you're going to see it again. And again. And then one more time. And I'm sure that what's really striking you as interesting as you watch this movie is that these spindles are forming all at the same time. In fact, she named this movie in synchrony. And so the question is, what coordinates this? Well, we actually do know a lot about the biochemistry involved in this coordination and how these nuclear divisions are regulated. Uh, but this is a very nice demonstration of that and how being able to watch things happen over time really can change the way you think about an experiment. Now, on the right-hand side, this movie is falsely colored. It's still just GFP, but if you have a little GFP, you're at the blue end of the rainbow, and as you just keep going up towards the red, you get more and more color. And so this is falsely colored, but it's all just GFP, and it's GFP that has been attached to a small peptide that is called a nuclear localization signal. So if there is a nucleus, the protein will be sucked right up into the nucleus. But when the cells divide, it's going to go all over the embryo. Or when the nuclei break down, it's going to go all over the embryo. So let me start that one and let you see that. Okay, the nuclei break down. GFP is everywhere in the embryo. The nuclei are about to reform. There they go, sucking up the GFP. And you're going to watch this a couple times. But here, it's not synchronous. Here, it seems to go from the lower right-hand corner up into the left-hand corner. And so that immediately asks the question, isn't this the same thing that's going on? Why is this going in this wave as opposed to being synchronous? And the answer, uh, or at least a friend of mine believes the answer is, is that her finger was a little bit heavy in the preparation. And she squished the sample a bit so that one part was a little bit, uh, was able to react a little bit faster than another. So this is a very subtle sign of damage. So if you see this, you know, your, your experiment's no good. So GFP has been used by hundreds, actually thousands. It, it's been estimated that uh, in the 20 years from 1994 when we published the paper to 2014, that about 160,000 papers, so I suspect now it's 200,000 papers, have used fluorescent proteins in one way or another in, in biology. Now, with all of this, so it's very nice that people have wanted to use this, but, um, and I don't know if this book is sold here in Uruguay, uh, but there's a famous children's book in the United States called If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. And I bring this up because it's a horrible story. Because if you give the mouse a cookie, then the mouse says, well, actually, I can't have the cookie unless you give me a glass of milk. And then once you give the mouse the glass of milk, the mouse says, well, thank you for the milk, but I need a straw to drink the milk. And then once you give him the straw, he says, well, OK, I'm drinking the milk, but now I need a napkin. And it just goes on and on. I think this is a terrific metaphor for scientists. You give them a nice green protein, and the first thing they do is start asking you for all the other colors, and stronger, and what else can we have? And it's just like the mouse in the book, because uh, it, 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 just, it just keeps going. But fortunately, along with Osamu Shimamura and myself, the third person that shared the Nobel Prize was Roger Chen, who unfortunately died about two years ago. And Roger answered all those, you know, dealt with the mice, <laughs> if you watch. Uh, they, he, he was the one that, that produced a brighter GFP. He was the first to change colors. He eventually then made this 
whole collection of things that he named after different uh, fruits. He didn't like the letters. He didn't like GFP and RFP and stuff. So he, he named it uh, like blueberry and melon and lime and banana and orange. And I don't know if that's tomato or cherry. Uh, but he, he named all of the, there were about 14 of them. I just don't have a slide showing all the different colors. But really wonderful tools, because once you have these tools, of course, you can then use them to look at more than one thing. And probably one of the, the most astonishing things was the work that Jeff Lichtman and Josh Sains did at Harvard, where they took four of the colors and just had them turn on at random in different cells in the nervous system so they could really look at the connectomics, that they could really see where cells were going from one place to another because now all the individual cells were being labeled by different colors. And if you're going to look at all the colors in the spectrum or generate all the colors in the spectrum, and you're going to look at the central nervous system of a mouse, there's only one word that you can call this, and that's what they did. They refer to this as brainbow. And these are some of their pictures, which are quite wonderful. It's been used in zebrafish and in Drosophila uh, to label cells. Uh, it's been very, very useful and, and, and very new. So let me talk a little more generally, I'll give you some examples of, of some of the consequences of GFP, because people have used it a lot, but it's also had a lot of different consequences. And I want to talk about that. I, but I want to refer this to what you probably already know about the laser. So Charles Towns uh, invents, uh, just does the physics, also at Columbia, um, that develops the maser and then the laser. And it's pure physics. Absolute, you know, it's a quantum physics project. And he had no applications in mind. And in fact, no one came to him while he was doing the work and said, Charles, we like what you're doing. We would really like you to invent something for us. For example, we would, you know, no one came to him and said, I work for the recording industry. We don't like the vinyl records we have, we should have CDs. Or people from the movies didn't say, it would be nice if we could really make some sort of really compact DVD that we could use. Certainly no one came to him saying, Charles, I own a grocery store, and the checkout people are having a horrible time getting all the numbers straight and putting things in. But we have a way of scanning our food. That would be terrific. And no one from the health community came and said, you know, if we had a tool that could allow us to do microsurgery, that would really be an advance. So all those applications came later. But what really started it was basic research that Charles Towns did to discover laser, which also led to other basic research, low energy or low temperature uh, effects. The, just recently, we had the discovery of gravitational waves. Absolutely required the laser for that work to be done. Without the laser, it could not have been done. And there have been others. So in my mind, all science leads to more fundamental research. It can lead to applications. And it can lead to the truly bizarre, which I'll give you some examples of. So, in terms of fundamental research. I told you we were interested in these touch sensing cells. So here is our animal with just the touch sensing cells labeled. And we can now take those animals. Now that we can see something, we can study it. And so we've taken these animals and we've mutated them and asked, can we find mutants that have more cells, or fewer cells, or cells in the wrong place, or cells that grow processes incorrectly? And the answer is yes, we found all of those. And each one of them leads to a study of the mechanism of 
how a cell gets made, how a cell gets made in a particular place, how a cell grows out in a particular way, what are the controls of that. So by being able to see the cells, we've been able to ask many more scientific questions, and it's led to a lot of other basic research. But I want to get back to what I showed you at the beginning of the talk, this early division in C. elegans. And you'll remember that I said that the two cells here were cells that are, one's going to give rise to just cells of the body, but the, the other one's going to give rise to sperm and egg. And we actually know why this is. Uh, and a, a very nice demonstration was done by Cliff Brangwine and, and Tony Hyman, where they found, that it had been known for a while that there were a particle, but they found that they, here's the particles. These particles are what make one of the descendants of this cell become the precursor to all the sperm and egg. The half, those particles have to be in that cell. And they were looking at the particles, and here it is just before this division is going to take place. And now you see the particles are only on one side. And of course, because they were labeled with GFP, they could just watch it. So here are the particles as this is just beginning to happen. And you see that all the particles are actually going away on this side and amassing on that side because they can look at it. But it's what they found when they looked at high definition, when they looked at high magnification, that really startled them. Because the particles were not really acting like traditional particles moving around. They, we knew that, they knew that there were no cell membranes around these but they were actually acting as if they were oil in water. And as they looked at other things, so this is referred to as a, a phase-separated particle. Okay, this particle is different from the red, regular cytoplasm. It doesn't mix with it. And they were the first to see this. What they discovered was a new component in the cytoplasm. As people have looked more, there are these same phase shifted things in the nucleolus. Others of these in, are also found uh, in the cytoplasm. It's a whole collection. A lot of them are uh, protein uh, RNA complexes that also have this. It's become a completely new and exciting area of biology. And it may also be an exciting aspect of health because there's some thought that if there are problems with these types of particles within the cell, if, it, if there's too much of the protein or the protein is altered, they don't have this fluid look. They start to precipitate out and might be the basis of the problems that we see in such diseases like Alzheimer's. Completely different way of looking at that process that came out of looking at GFP, and I might add, looking at GFP in C. elegans. Okay, but there have been other applied things. I'll give you one other example of uh, a medical application. When we teach introductory biology and we teach about viruses, we usually talk about some bacterial viruses, and we say, okay, the virus infects the cell, and the there's a lot of copies of the virus made, and then the cell explodes, and the virus goes everywhere, infecting other cells. This is how we think about viruses being transmitted from one infected cell to another. Now, if that's the case, that's actually good news. Because if you're, you want to make an antibody, if you want to have a vaccine against a virus, and it's being released, then the antibody could gobble it up, could bind to it. But when people actually looked at mouse cells that were infected with the AIDS virus, HIV, they got a very different picture. So here is a cell, the, GF, uh, the AIDS virus now makes a protein that has GFP on it. And so you see a particle here, the, uh, this HIV, there's actually another cell attached right here, and you see that particle just went right into the cell. No explosion. No availability, essentially, for the antibody, or at least very little. 
So once you learn that something like that is happening, you have to start thinking about alternate ways of maybe treating this disease. Why is it that those cells came together? Is there a way of preventing that? Is there a way of stopping the budding of these infectious particles from going to other cells? So it's been used to investigate problems of human disease. And now let me go to the truly unexpected. Uh, one I'll just tell you, I had that thing about changing industry. Soon after my Nobel, I was asked to give a talk at, uh, the, for the board of the Marine Biology Lab at Woods Hole in Massachusetts. And I went and I gave him a talk. And after the talk, one of the people came up, he said, uh, Marty, thank you for the talk. I'm Jim Sharp. I'm the president of Zeiss Microscopes in the United States. And uh, I have something to give you. And I said, a microscope? And he said, no. <laughs> so it was a little disappointing. But I, <laughs> but nonetheless, I said, uh, he said, but before I, I do this, I want to tell you something. You don't know this, but you had a very strong effect on Zeiss, uh, on the company. Because in 1994, before your paper came out, the Zeiss company had decided that it wasn't that great a deal to be making fluorescent microscopes. So they were going to stop the production of fluorescent microscopes. Your paper came out. All of a sudden, everyone wanted a microscope. So thank you for helping the company. I think I also at that point asked him for a microscope and it didn't work either. <laughs> so you never know what the consequences are going to be. And then in 2012 in the United States, there was an investment ad. And the investment ad, does anyone know why a luminous protein from jellyfish could affect the optics industry in Germany? So somebody that wrote that ad had listened to my talk because I'm the only one that would say that. Uh, so they use that as advertising. The rest of it is a little hazy. Anyway, that's one of the unexpected. A couple other unexpected. Bob Burlage is a uh, scientist in, uh, was a scientist at Oak Ridge National Labs. And he knew that E. coli or some bacteria had a very interesting regulatory unit for a gene. And that regulatory unit was activated in the presence of the explosive TNT. So he made E. coli that could turn on GFP in the presence of TNT. So he has his bacteria on a regular plate, no fluorescence, has a little TNT in the solution in the plate, puts the bacteria on overnight, bright green. You might be asking yourself how strange some people are to do things like that. <laughs> but he had a very interesting idea in the back of his head. And that idea was that he knew, it stemmed from the fact that he knew that landmines leak TNT. And so he was looking for a way to detect landmines. Horrible aspect of war that usually winds up killing and maiming innocent people that have nothing to do with combatants and after the combat has left the area. And so he had his bacteria. He told a friend they somehow could get their hands on this. I don't know how. It may be because it was at Oak Ridge Lab. They, his friend buried five landmines in a three meter by five meter plot of land. And that, that they're not stupid. These were not connected. Right? <laughs> but they had TNT in them. And so they sprayed the area with the bacteria. And at night, uh, Bob came back, and he used his UV light to see if there were any patches of bacteria uh, that were glowing. And there were. So he could detect, at least in that initial experiment, where the landmines were. This experiment has been repeated by several groups. And there's even now still a group, I know it's a collaboration between a group at the University of Florida and a group at, in Israel that are continuing to do this. But 
there is an inherent problem. It's a great idea. You know, if we could protect people and get rid of, you know, be able to dissect landmines, it'd be good. This is the one experiment you do not want any false negatives. <laughs> right? So they have to really make sure that it's going to detect everything. And still, obviously, people have to be careful. You can't go dancing around there. But nonetheless, it might really save lives, which I think is a one, I thought it was a wonderful original idea. Another unusual thing that happened with GFP, uh, you probably know that, the, that people in Japan are very proud of their silk industry, and there's people that still work on silk in the agricultural uh, uh, department, or agricultural ministry, and in one of their labs, a couple of the um, researchers decided they would hook different colored fluorescent proteins to, to silk fibroin so they could make fluorescent silk. And they did, and they made some clothing out of it. I'm not entirely sure this is a great idea because I think you have to walk around with a lamp all the time <laughs> to sort of show off what it is. But nonetheless, I thought it was pretty cool that they did this. And you may be thinking to yourself, OK, when is he finally going to get to talk about people? Has GFP ever been put into people? So the first person that was claimed that uh, GFP was put in is this person. <laughs> and I actually know the screenwriter for this movie because he's at Columbia, and his daughter went to elementary school with my daughter. And I asked him, I said, you know, because you see in the beginning of the movie, there's this jellyfish, and they stick a hypodermis and suck out the GFP. It's just a fantastic preparation. Uh, and there's a lab notebook and everything. And I said, why? How did you know about my work? And he said, uh, well, actually, I have no idea what you do. <laughs> I said, well, how did you get that wonderful start to the movie? And he said, well, we had a student working with us from MIT, and he forced us to do that. <laughs> so there's an anonymous MIT student who made, apparently, the first transgenic human, uh, at least in the movie. GFP actually has been used in some clinical trials in people, not because it's used as a cure or anything, but as a test. You know, the first, uh, you know, there's three phases in clinical trials. The first clinical trial is, is it safe enough to use in people? And does it actually maybe go where you want it to go? And there are people that believe that certain viruses actually preferentially go to cancers. If that's true, seems to be true in mice, but if that's true, then those are magic bullets that could home to cancer cells and bring something in with them that would kill the cancer cell. This would be quite terrific if, if it's true. So I, have, I understand that over the last couple of years, there have been several first phase clinical trials to see if viruses are getting in. Well, how do you know where the virus goes, right? The easiest way is to do what they did with the HIV situation, have the virus make GFP. And then when you take out the tumor, when a surgeon takes out the tumor, they can say, oh, it's obvious here's the tumor, but all this normal tissue over here didn't have the fluorescence. So that's what they were looking at it for as a tool to do this. So it actually has been used in people, but remember this is a way of getting something in through DNA that you then look at subsequent generations. And I'm not sure that there's a really important use for that as opposed to just fluorescence uh, in medicine. In any case, let me finish with a couple of ideas of what I think the research really does show. Uh, I said before that you know, uh, scientists were all geniuses. I told you Shimamura's story. Roger Chen's story is he actually was a genius. He, uh, we have a contest in the United States called, well, it started off as Westinghouse Science Talent Search, then it became the Intel Science Talent Search. Now another company sponsors it. It's called the Regeneron Science Talent Search. And it is for the single best high school student research project for that year. Roger won it. So he was doing 
groundbreaking science as a high school student. He continued all his life to, to do astonishing things, mainly with fluorescence. So, yep, there is a genius in this. And I told you Shimamura's story. You will have noticed that I didn't say much of my story. One of the reasons is that this is a chemistry prize. And I usually don't show my transcript because all of my chemistry grades, actually all of my chemistry and physics grades in, colleges, uh, in college uh, were C's. And I'm very afraid that the Nobel Foundation will take the prize away. <laughs> so um, I definitely would not be considered a, a genius in any way. In fact, when I was doing my postdoc, there was a member of the staff who I would periodically talk to, and I knew he didn't have a very high regard for me uh, compared to the other people that were there. They were really spectacular people. And after the Nobel, I happened to come by the lab, and he had actually asked if he could see me, and we sat down, we had a very nice conversation. It started off, and he said, Marty, you know, I haven't seen you since you won the prize, congratulations. And I looked at him and I said, Mark, Pretty surprising, isn't it? <laughs> and he, he looked at me. Mark's a very straight, he's a, a bit of a curmudgeon, but very straightforward guy. And he, and he said something that if I ever write my autobiography, this is going to be the title. He looked at me and said, yes, you far exceeded my expectations. <laughs> I don't think any of that makes any difference. I think it's just the passion you bring and the excitement you bring to the research and the desire to do things. I don't think there's any road to it. You just get involved in doing the science. The second thing, I think many, if not most, real discoveries in science are accidents. Shimamura threw the damn stuff in the sink, right? I mean, you can't get more of an accident than that, and it's the wrong color. I happened to go to a seminar and not fall asleep, and happened to be the only person in the room that worked on a transparent animal. No one else had any interest in using that thing as a tool, and, 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 and that at all. Um, the physicist Enrico Fermi had a wonderful line that goes something on the order of, if you do a, an experiment and it confirms your hypothesis, you've made a measurement. But if it doesn't confirm your hypothesis, you've made a discovery. And so we're making discoveries all the time. Not all of them are big discoveries, but we make them all the time. And the way to make these discoveries is to do a lot of experiments and hopefully, we, we hope that we keep our eyes open so that something unusual can be found because there's unusual things all the time. Seymour Benzer, a wonderful geneticist, used to tell this story about the early days when people were looking at phage, bacterial viruses. They used to put the phage on big petri dishes, and because there wasn't a lot of room in the lab, they played out you know, equal number of phage onto all the, the, the plates and stacked the plates up. And every time they did the experiment, the, the top two or so plates had the most phage, and there became less and less and less as it went down. Well, the reason for that was light actually induced the phage. And what was happening is they were stacking it, so each plate was shading the one below it. If they had taken all their plates and put them all flat on the table, they would have had equal numbers. You can't control for things that you don't know about, and these things pop up all the time. So accidents, and sometimes accidents are quite wonderful. I think it's really important to actually be sometimes ignorant, but certainly stubborn, and have a willingness to try to do the experiment. We often talk about a weekend experiment, an experiment that someone does sometime on the weekend when no one else is around because you're too ashamed to tell anyone you're doing that experiment. You do the experiment, it works, you just crow about it on Monday morning, you're very happy with yourself. When it doesn't work, just ask people how their weekend went. <laughs> and, but you have to try it, so that that's the lesson out of that. The real story here, you know, the Nobel is given to three people. I've taught, told you here 
of at least seven people. Malcolm Kasataban coming up with LAC-Z as a marker of cells. That was incredibly important. My wife making the first protein fusion. Gia Skirkin actually doing the first experiment. And certainly Douglas Prasher, who was the person that identified the cDNA, isolated the cDNA from GFP. And all of those people could have equally shared the prize or had a prize for themselves and what they did. Uh, unfortunately, to give it to three people, I can't tell you how much I would have loved it had my wife been one of the other three. It would have been great. Uh, but the real advantage, the reason GFP got a prize at all was not really because of what we did. It was because of all the thousands of people and what they did and all the different ways it was used to discover new biology and to make new applications and so on. So scientific progress is cumulative. Now, what I didn't mention is that fluorescent molecules have an interesting property. And that is if you shine light on one, let's say a blue fluorescent protein, it'll absorb ultraviolet light and give off blue. If you have a yellow fluorescent protein, it'll absorb yellow and give off, or absorb blue and give off yellow. So when you shine UV on these and the molecules are far apart, most, the UV hits this molecule, this molecule doesn't do anything with, this molecule gets hit by UV, you get a lot of blue, but a little of the blue comes over here, and so you get a little bit of yellow. But if the molecules are right next to each other, touching actually, then if you hit the first one with ultraviolet light, it doesn't make blue light, it transfers its energy to the yellow fluorescent protein, and now just a little blue gets made and a lot of yellow. So this is a way of telling that molecules are either close together or far apart. And I think that's a wonderful metaphor for how we do science. That transfer of energy from one molecule to the other is in the same sense what we do. We take the results, and ideas from other people, change them by our own experiments and ideas, and then give them off in a different form to be picked up by still another person that's gonna transfer it and change it again. And so I think uh, it really is the progress that so many people contribute that has made this molecule an important molecule. Uh, this is gonna look like an advertisement that grant support and university support was important, but it's not that. It really is that university support was important for me for something I already told you. I don't like to be told what to do, what project I should work on, and the university gives me enough freedom to work on that research. This also is what comes from the support. My support has come over the years from the National Institute of Health, NIH, and I have to write proposals but I think most people outside of science uh, don't understand, and I think it's incumbent on us as scientists to explain to people what the real basis of scientific funding is. People outside the sciences think that everything is done by the one thing that they know about, and that's contracts, because they know business. A contract is, I come to you and I say, there are four things I promise to do, and if you like that I should do those, pay me, and I promise to do those four things. That's a contract, an agreement between two parties to do this. But we don't write, for the most part, contracts. We write proposals, and in the proposals we say, here are the four things that we think should really be done right now. And if you think that as well, then please pay me and I'll do that work. But then there's an unwritten part that everyone understands is there, but no one will write it down because we're scared. And that part is, I promise not to be an idiot. If someone comes up with a better idea or if I make one of these accidental discoveries or if something else comes up and I can put the money to better use, I'm going to do that. And you can judge me when I get renewed and see how I've done. So if somebody invents GFP, I'm going to use GFP. Because why should I go back to using the other methods? 
If someone invents CRISPR-Cas9 or any of the other methods, why should I do that? And in fact, there's no one I know of that has written a grant proposal that five years down the line said, oh, I have to do that five-year-old experiment. It's out of date. It's, it's completely wrong. So we don't do it, but that's what we say. So what we're really being paid for is the promise that we're going to work for that period of time to the best of our abilities and that we have that. And I think people outside of science should learn about that. Next point, the people that really do the work but also are really the innovators are the postdocs, the graduate students, and even the undergraduates in the lab. When we started giving away, when I started giving away GFP to people to work on, it was always the same way. The head of the lab would call me up because they're the only one allowed to use the telephone, I think, and they ask, they'd say, they start off, their sentence was almost always the same. They'd say, my graduate student or my undergraduate or my postdoc told me you have this thing called GFP. They want it. What do they want? What is this stuff? And I'd explain it, and they'd say, oh, yeah, we do want that. That's great. Yes, have, please send that. And so we'd send it off. But it was always initiated by the people really doing the work in the lab. And uh, I, I, that still is the case in my lab, certainly. Um, I think that all life should be studied. This story started off with a jellyfish. Well, it started off with Einstein, but it, it started off with a jellyfish. Um, and we, I think, do a disservice to think that we only should look at a few organisms or put all of our studies into these few organisms. These organisms are usually referred to as model organisms. C. elegans, nematode, drosophila, fruit flies, uh, yeast, uh, mice. These are model organisms. And I don't like the term because model organism implies that we're modeling something. We're testing something out that we really are more concerned about something else. And that something else in most people's mind is human biology. And I think this is so narrowing of what we learn by studying the biology more broadly, that I want to refer to these animals in a different way. I'm going to call them pioneer organisms, because they don't just model what we know about human health. They tell us about human biology, biology in general, that we never imagined before. They give us the new avenues to address issues in human health that we would never know simply by looking at modeling something. So I like the idea of pioneer organisms. And my last point is that it's really important to do basic research, fundamental research. There is a big push in virtually every country I've ever visited and in the United States for what's called translational medicine. That is bringing the discoveries that have been made in the laboratory uh, into the clinics so that treatments and cures can happen from the knowledge we already have. And as I get older, this is a wonderful idea. Older and sicker. Uh, this is a great, great idea. However, I, it doesn't take much to realize that in order to do translational medicine, you need to have something to translate. And that something to translate is basic research. It is what drives all of this, what drives applications, innovation. It's knowing new things about biology, knowing those new organelles, knowing uh, new methods like CRISPR-Cas9, starting to do things with GFP and other fluorescent proteins. These all gave new avenues for people to study human disease and concerns about human health. But without this, these new discoveries, we have this very narrow way of looking at human health problems. So you have to have something to, tra to translate, and that means there has to be a mix. Actually, I think everybody in the world wants to translate what they have. They really would like to have these things. That's all nice. No one needs to be motivated to do that. But governments certainly need to be motivated to support basic research so that more and more of these applications can be made. 
And I want to leave you, my final slide is with my favorite quote about basic research. It came from Robert R. Wilson, who was a physicist, sculptor, and the designer of this wonderful particle accelerator that was the largest particle accelerator in the world uh, until the CERN super collider came on line a, a couple of years ago. This is the Fermi Lab in Batavia, Illinois. And Wilson in 1969, to remind you, that's when the United States is involved in what it called the Vietnam War. So a lot of concern about national security and defense. He's asked to go to Congress to justify why the US government should build this accelerator, this science fair project, more or less. And one of the senators, that was friendly to the idea, said, Dr. Wilson, please tell the other members of the committee all the way, how many ways are there going to be that this particle accelerator will help national security? And Wilson looked at him and said, none. <laughs> Which was not the answer that uh, John Pastore, the senator, wanted. And so he asked the question again, no, no, really, how many ways? And no, none. And finally, I think in desperation, he says, look, Dr. Wilson, in what respect will this particle accelerator help the national defense? At which point, Wilson said the following. It has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with whether we are good poets, uh, good painters, great, good sculptors, great poets. I mean all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending the country except to make it worth defending. Thank you very much.